this episode, uh, honestly, any guests after this one that we about to intro, you gotta be looking a little different, like, you know, the price going up on all the you know, the price going up after this one, the price going up, man, um, man, man, we got Master Song, one of three black Master Songs, Carlton McCoy, CEO of Heights Seller, uh, again, second black African American song. It's nice to be like in a place where the sun is expected, like not, you know what I mean? <laughs> not because you know, in Michigan, it's like I mean, you, I imagine you've probably been to Detroit before. Or, I haven't, actually no, okay. Really? So, in the Midwest, it's like, man, when the sun's out, it's like, oh, well, this is amazing, but then everybody oh, else yeah? is like, you know, it's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've only been to Michigan once. I had a buddy in college uh, who lived in St. Joseph, Michigan. Okay. It's okay. wine yeah. country, yeah, a little bit of wine. Yeah. Is down it? That way. Okay, mm-hmm. I have no clue. That's not where I was in culinary school then. So yeah. we drove from Hyde Park, where the CIA is, okay. all the way to St. Joseph. It was a long fucking drive. Yeah. Did you live where? Um, you live in, you lived in Hyde Park. Yeah, I went to school there. So okay. I was there for four years. Yeah, and, uh, I went to visit his family. Um, we we're eating at at the time Charlie Trotter's restaurant in Chicago mm-hmm. was still around. So we, the whole goal was eat at Charlie Trotter where we ate. So we visited his family and drove down to Chicago. Got it. There. Yeah. Love yeah, it. we're we're currently staying up in that or near that way, uh, South Haven, Michigan. Cool. Um. So yeah, there's a nice little wine trail that's uh, popping up on the southwest side of mm-hmm. the state. Yeah. I work in the Finville AVA, which I think is was the third AVA uh, cool. to be established um, in the country. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're definitely doing some cool things. Our, uh, the winemaker at the winery I work at was originally from out here, mm-hmm. uh, a couple miles near Calistoga, yeah. uh, but moved out to Michigan just to experiment and just have the freedom and flexibility to just kind of yeah, play around with the grapes that he wanted to play around Yeah, I think with. it's nice that it's um, regions outside of, like, California, Washington, Oregon, yeah. New York are actually getting some yeah. attention because they make very good wines. We do, we do, we do. When, when, I in, uh, when I was in Colorado, we used to they make really, really good wine in Colorado because um, it's high elevation and it's nice and cool. Yeah. Um, yes, and, um, they're not cheap. Yeah, very good, very good. Where did you uh, you live in Hyde Park? Well, the the camp is sort of like just outside of it's like in between Downs and Hyde Park and okay. Poughkeepsie, which is interesting because Poughkeepsie was um, Poughkeepsie was sort of like I grew up in DC, so it's sort of like PG County where it was like one a lot of the housing projects got knocked down and so forth, mm-hmm. people got displaced out. So Poughkeepsie ended up being this place where a lot of families from the, the city would, would move out of the city and move up there. So it was actually like a really, it was like a, a hub for like drug activity. Mm. But it was a town over from Hyde Park is where FDR's house is and okay. the CIA is. It's like a really nice rural town. Yeah. And then you got Poughkeepsie next to it, which is like completely hood. And like you go to like a store and they've got like the bulletproof glass. And yeah. Yeah, it was a really odd mix. Yeah. Yep. So I don't know if well people that are listening will probably know this, but I've listened to a couple of podcast episodes with you. You weren't always bald. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's correct. I also wasn't always bald. Yeah, but I didn't have cornrows like you though. No, I uh, I used to have very long hair actually. <laughs> yeah, but that was like the thing when I was in high school. Everyone yeah. had long hair. Um, so, um, and then I started working in the hospitality industry, and that. Yeah, yeah, it changed Wasn't everything. Cut it. <laughs> Definitely. No, I started to, you know, we, we, I started, you start seeing like the widow's peak. Oh, you know? yep, yep. Well, when yeah. I went to college, I had to cut my hair. My grandmother made me cut my hair. And so, you know, it's like go to the barbershop, get a shape of every weekend kind of thing. And it just slowly started. The barber was like, bro, like you're starting <laughs> to, you know, and I'm like, that's ah, fine. I'm like, just tighten it up. Yes. And then it was a joke. We, we, um, I was graduating in, in the Color Institute of America. It's unique. Did you, you go to two graduations. You have the graduation of the second year and the fourth year. Mm-hmm. And this is the first graduation. And my grandmother drove up for my graduation. I thought it would be really funny. We went to dinner. Came back to the dorm. Like four of us shaved our heads. <laughs> and then walked down the aisle with a shaved head. 
my hair really never grew back after that. Wow. <laughs> it was sort of like, but it was actually sort of a blessing. It sped yeah. up the process, and I didn't have that awkward phase like most guys go through where it's like they're in mm-hmm. denial, they're going bald, and you just got to own it. It's yeah. not, a, not, not everyone can, can pull it off. It was, it took me a minute to own it. For yeah, sure. and it's actually yeah. very easy. <laughs> but I mean, the way you held on was like super smooth. Like, <laughs> I, was, I was proud of you, yeah. <clears throat> but it, it's actually very easy. It's very convenient. Yeah, okay. you know? for sure. Occasionally I'll, I'll go and I'll, um, that was a great thing about growing a beard and it's occasionally I'll go to the barbershop to get it shaped up. Yep. So you like mm-hmm. rekindle you know, the relationship with the barbershop yeah. Yeah, experience, Definitely. which is nice. But it's very different here because there's no, Mark grew up, I'm half black and half Jewish, and I grew up in a black neighborhood. The black barbershop is very unique. Here, all the, the, the barbershops and the barbers that I experienced were all Mexican guys. Yeah. It's a very different feel. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. When I was out here, I had to go to Vallejo. Yeah. To <laughs> yeah. That's like the closest. Like, uh, I remember when Darren got it. He's like, "Where's the barbershop?" I'm like, "Bro, look like I <laughs> like I don't know." Yeah, I was like, "Yeah." All right. And I think he got he went to the Mexican barbershop. He got a really bad haircut. He called he called I came <laughs> freaking out. <laughs> Scoot on my face. That's funny. Yeah. Um, yeah. You mentioned Akimi. Uh, let's quickly yeah. talk on the Roots Fund real sure. quick and uh, how that or like how that partnership came together and just like what that process just kind of looked like and like yeah. the importance of that. Yeah, so I've known Akimi um, since we were, we were really young. Since we were both in culinary school, so in Johnson and Wells. And I was at the CIA. We, we both got scholarships to go to culinary school from a program called um, the Careers Through Culinary Arts Program. It was in New York. It was started by Richard Grausman, and um, what they do is essentially they go and, and they find kids in, in tougher neighborhoods mm-hmm. in the city who have an interest or can cook, or have an interest in cooking, and they help them get scholarships to culinary school, Got sort it. of mentor them, help them get jobs and things like that. So we were both in that program. That's how we met. Um, and we sort of like here and there kept in touch, um, both busy, but with touching once in a while. We would you know, always see each other at CCAP events and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I had this idea to, to do this, I called her because I said, look, I knew that she had done work for nonprofits. I didn't know anything about nonprofits. Right. It, it's, you know, starting and in, in running a nonprofit organization is, like, you really have to know what you're doing. Or one, you can do a lot of legal things. There's a lot of things you're yeah. not allowed to do with a nonprofit. Like getting the structure set up, mm-hmm. getting approved, how you have to process it. It's very, very complicated, as it should be, because a lot of people do some really dishonest things with nonprofits. Right. So I called her and I was like, look, I got this idea. And essentially, like, just imagine like CCAP, but for like wine. And at that point, Akimi hadn't really interacted with the wine industry, um, but she's an extremely driven person. Mm-hmm. She cares a lot about our community. And um, I just, that, that, that to again. me was like, I thought was the easiest part for her to. Yeah. To learn, she's also a very magnetic personality, oh, yeah. mm-hmm. very genuine. So people, it's really hard to not be attached to her, or connect with her. Mm-hmm. You know, so um, we started looking at how we wanted to be structured. And um, I got on the phone with Tahira, and we all sort of came together and was like, "Hey, look, I think this would be something that we could do." Because we also saw, you know, at the time, there was a lot of pop up organizations. That where I was really concerned was, I didn't feel that people who are doing them or people who can actually be um, long-term committed to it mm-hmm. to make change. It was sort of like this thing where it was like, you know, people were just doing it to get like street cred and like, this would be cool. But it's like, for the I, clout, I, for the clout, clout is what yeah. they say. Yeah. But mm-hmm. I, I, I like respect it and like I honored like how difficult yeah. it was. So um, I knew that I couldn't run it, you know, like it was very easy for me to like put my name and say, I'm going to do this thing. But I, I, I wanted to, to like do something real, and I knew I couldn't do it. Yeah. So I didn't keep me involved, and she really just took it and ran with it. And we just kept sort of working on how we wanted it to work. And um, I connected with a lot of people, and then she took that and ran with it. And we just keep working through those networks. We got a lot of um, early sort of seed money from people who believed in what we were doing. Um, nice. And that allowed us to bring a chemo full time. And it's just grown like crazy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, um, it's crazy. Yeah. And it's been. I mean, I, I, uh, I talked to, I talked to Kim on the way up here. Um, she's like my sister. We, yeah. Um, but we, um, as much as we talk, Akimi does her own. She does it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I'm, a, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm now a board member. Tahir's a board member. And we advise, but it really is her yeah, really oh, running. She's, she's got a small team. These ladies are just 
are killing it. So um, it's been it was great to be a part of something that um, it, it turned out better than even what I oh, yeah. perceived, which is which is really fantastic. And it's to me, it was sort of this. It was it was a moment where I was looking at. Um, I mean, just because of the wine industry and, and to some extent the culinary world, you are so detached from the black community in the sense that sometimes you're sort of even blind to some of the issues and the barriers that exist there because, mm-hmm. you know, because I was really blessed that um, I had a few people that sort of like drew, drew me, like gave me opportunities or at least opened some doors mm-hmm. for me to take advantage of early on where I wasn't like starting from scratch. Right. So I didn't yep. really understand and fully respect that, like what it means to just start from scratch. Um, and being in the culinary industry actually helped me into that door of restaurants. Mm-hmm. So it was sort of natural mm-hmm. I can get into wine, but a lot of people don't have that. So um, I sort of looked around and was like, well, what have, I, what have I really done for my community? I've, I've mentored a lot of people, but they weren't necessarily you know, people of color because that's that wasn't the environment I was in. Mm-hmm. So the yeah. people who are fantastic people, but that I wasn't mentoring my own community right. in any way or helping to create opportunities. Mm-hmm. So that was really the, the driving force. I was like, you know, I'm, I'm at the age now, I'm in a place where I can create. Um, I never thought it was going to be like the Roots Fund. I was like, it could be yeah. even just a few people, um, you know, to try to, to, to make some difference there and create some opportunities. But, um, and then it just grew into something yeah. huge. Super crazy. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's like, I, that's how I did Harvest here was through the Roots Fund. Yeah. Uh, so it was nice to have that opportunity, have that door, you know, mm-hmm. open for, you know, like, I, I mean, still, like, even being out here, I don't know how many people like us are in production yeah. or have the opportunity to go out to Martha's Vineyard or yeah. go out to Trailside and see this stuff. Like, mm-hmm. So, like, having that exposure was super dope and mm-hmm. helps me move forward with yeah. what I'm doing now. Like, if I didn't do that then I feel like I'm missing everything about wine. Yeah. So um, kudos to everyone at the Roots Fund. You guys really, really did the thing with that. And just, again, Akimi is just like, just like a snowball. Just like yeah. It's, yeah. it's going. Yeah. It's going. So shout out to her. Shout out to you. Shout out to everyone, that whole team there. So. And before we leave it, um, maybe you could talk a little bit about vision when you look over the next five, five years. Because like, there's so many people that we met last night even, um, like Jamal, yeah. that, I mean, benefited from the the roots fund and it's super dope i mean from an outsider's perspective it's like dang like, yeah you know <laughs> yeah. you almost wish you could take 10 years back and even though i mean the opportunity presents itself now and jamal killed it um and had a lot to bring home and has done a lot for people yeah. in our community which is a passing on effect what does that look like uh in the future i don't know i mean i think you know one thing i've learned i think just from my life and experience is that you always have a sort of goal and vision but it don't it almost never ends up Exactly, there you always take these little detours and stuff. And I think, yeah. you know, I think, you know, how do I guess, you know, how do we envision success for the Roots Fund in the next five years? It was always about um, getting people employed and having careers. You know, I'm, um, I'm, a bo- you know, anytime someone tells you they're a hustler, that means they're a capitalist. And I'm a- American through and through. I, you know, I believe in ambition. I believe in and, um, you know, working hard to be successful and um, at least that part of capitalism, I believe in. And I, I, I've always said that unless people have jobs and they have careers, yeah. then, then it's all bullshit. Like, I, I, I did not want to create a culture of people just sitting around studying books just for the sake of it. Yeah. That's great culture, but, how you, you know, what's, what's the career like? Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I, I wanted people to have... It doesn't mean everyone has yeah. to have a career in mind, right? Yeah. You know, it's, it's, you know it, you're also not forcing it. But I think that... You know, you've got to create an environment where for the right people and the people who are really willing to do the work, you know, ultimately um, those people have opportunities and, and be in, in, in great positions in the wine industry and in any sector because there's many parts of the wine industry, wherever they wanted to go. And wherever that was, then we wanted to open some doors for them and, and get them to work. That's that what it's about. Sense. You know, yeah, it's, it's until you see people in, in, in leadership positions of, Yep. of color it's sort of you know that's that's really the goal in five years yeah definitely which is a short amount of time especially in the wine industry yeah oh yeah 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 i'm, I'm definitely super blessed to you know like again having this experience the confidence to go back home like a year and a half ago none of this would even be possible honestly uh with, with without this platform this podcast 
And even that, it was like, send my resume to the Roots Fund, send my resume to Wine and Unify. Who yeah. cares? Fuck it. Like, yeah. They're going to say yes or no. Whatever. Correct. And if not, I'm going to still go get it. Thankfully, I was able to um, have these opportunities with both organizations, but even like looking at the job I t- or job description for the marketing manager job that I have now, mm-hmm. a year ago, I would have been like, there's a couple of things on there I don't have. Mm-hmm. Sure. And I would just toss it aside. But to have this confidence to see, even there still was a couple of things where I was like, eh, all right, whatever. But I'm like, I can do this. Like, I've been doing this. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, just to have that confidence, um, just to, you know, walk in that room and knowing that I'm the only one for this job right now. So yeah. um, super dope to, again, be out, out here with the community. Uh, shout out to Daryl. Just like like minded folks that are go getters, yeah. um, you know, talk about Darwin, George, Darren, mm-hmm. like everybody that's out here. It's like we all, all have the same goals, so that just helped me like push past the things that I thought I couldn't do, just because that everyone out here is doing it, mm-hmm. you're doing it. Just like man, I can't thank this place enough, and then just everybody that wants to get shit done. Yeah, it's been dope. So big ups, big ups. <clears throat> Question for you, really quick. Um, for people of color in the industry, is that a privilege, or, or how do you use that to be a privilege in this in the industry? How do you use being a person of color to, as a privilege? I mean, not so. You are one of few, right? Um, and and being in a lot of rooms, you are one of few, and using that to your benefit versus using it to uh, seeing as. I hate, say the word, I hate the word victimizing, but almost victimizing, right? Yeah. But, yeah. Um, it's like when somebody says, like, oh, I'm not, I don't mean to offend you, but I hate your shirt. Yeah. But yeah, 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 yeah. same thing. Yeah. Do, do you get what I'm asking here? Yeah, I mean, I think, look, look the, the um, my grandmother always taught me not to, to victimize myself. She's like, the, yeah. the reality is reality. Like, if someone's going to hate you, they're going to hate you. And sometimes you can change that, but often you can't. But you still got to live in the world. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. you still have to work. You still have to, you know, it, it doesn't excuse that or it doesn't, you know, um, mean that you shouldn't work towards at least trying to change it. But you got to live in the world. And how are you going to do that? And I think that we're in a world now that people are aware of the value of different perspectives and in, 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 in points of view in, in a room uh, and the value that can have for teams and for companies. And yeah. I think that that's, you know, that's a new sort of epiphany that a lot of companies have had. So I think it's, it's about being your true self and having a different perspective that can bring value to a company. You know, I, I, I was doing this interview and, and someone asked me, it was a very good question, which is, what can African Americans bring to the wine industry? And it wasn't an insult. It was, it was a question asked by a very intelligent person. And I said, it's a great question. So I sort of answered it through the guise of every other industry. I said, well, you know, what have African Americans added to fashion, and to art, and to music? Um, it's all very different, but it's its own unique culture that doesn't exist anywhere in the world. I was, I was watching this this interview with Quincy Jones when he, he talks about he says he doesn't want to be called African American. I want to be called Black American because my experience has nothing to do with Africa. <laughs> He's like my culture, just like every culture in the world, is inspired by it. He's like, but we're a very unique culture in the world that has had probably one of the biggest impacts of any culture in recent history, um, culturally. So you have to understand the value of that and the significance of that. And it's a beautiful thing when you can see your culture. I I travel all over the world, and you see black American culture everywhere. Go to Korea. Their fashion, their music, everything. It's it's like Mm -hmm. right out of, like, Queens. You know what I mean? Like, it's nuts. Mm -hmm. Um, They even practice religion the way we do. They have Baptist churches and Pentecostal churches. Wow. It's nuts, yeah. right? So you have this really, really unique um, perspective on the world that you can bring to that boardroom, to the table, or to the cellar, or wherever you're, you know, you're working. And I think that's really important. Now, I've always told people as well is, you know, you, um, you know, acclimating has always been looked upon as a very negative thing. Mm-hmm. The idea of going into the room and not being 100% your true self. And initially, I was on that boat, and then I started realizing that no one really is. Like, if you could take the whitest person to go in the room, they're adjusting themselves somehow for that environment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They just are. 
just looks different. And I think the way our community takes it so tough is because we've had, you know, because of our history here, that everyone who's coming into an office somewhere, in some way, is adjusting. It's the way they dress. You, the way people dress at work, they don't dress like that at home. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, yeah. the, I mean, the, the way you speak to people, it's very different than you speak to people at home, mm-hmm. your family, everyone. Yeah. So also understanding that, like, being your authentic, true self doesn't mean that you don't have to adjust who you are a little bit in, in the workplace. That should be expected, depending on your environment. Mm-hmm. But I think there's a point of view that the black American community has that can make the wine industry, I think, a much more exciting, more soulful place. That's the nature of our culture, and I think that um, we're very high-spirited, very soulful people and very genuine. And I think the wine industry, if you were to say what does the wine industry right now, I could probably tell you every marketing person in the wine industry right now, if you took away race or color or culture... And what they're looking for is exactly that. Well, we need more energy, more excitement. Yep. We need more, uh, you know, people who are genuine and soulful. And great, yeah. Well, you just explained the exact contribution that black Americans bring to the wine industry. Mm-hmm. So wow. um, I think you'll start to see that. You also have to understand the power of the demographic. You know, black Americans are, are you know, 13% of the population. That's a lot of people, mm-hmm. you know. And if you look at the people to, to combine just people of color generally, between Latinx, black, I mean, this is a massive chunk of America. In, in the vast majority of the population does not engage with wine. Mm-hmm. So as an as industry, if you were to say, what demographic should you be targeting where there's potential for growth, it's there. Yep. Right? It's yeah. just the reality. You know, the people who are already drinking wine, the goal is to get them to drink a little bit more upstream. But there's so much of this country that does not drink wine. You know, because, they, you know, there is... First of all, there's aren't, there aren't people who look or sound like them selling it and getting behind it. Um, but culturally, because it was looked upon as a class thing, this European thing, they were sort of like, whatever, that's your thing, this is our thing. Mm-hmm. And I think that, that line is, 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 is being removed now, which is exciting. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, mean, that's, I mean, that's our goal of this platform, you know, to make it more accessible. To make, you know, like, you know, like we have friends that don't know jack shit about wine. Uh, we didn't know jack shit about yeah. wine. Oh, yeah, you know, 100. I mean, yeah. Who knows but, what the hell we were drinking. But, but you know, the thing is, I also feel it's 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 tough because, you know, people go, well, you know, we find that liquor and beer consumption is going up and wine going down. Like, when you you know, for me, I try to pull the geek out. And it's, it's mm-hmm. and it's pretty obvious because, like, I'm a master of I study wine for so much of my life. But I think as, as a business person, you got to pull that out and go, why are they winning? And they're winning because they don't need you to be a professional professional and understand what you're drinking to enjoy it yep all they do is they show you how to have fun with it and whether you want to learn you can learn or not mm-hmm. right i would argue that the cicerone movement has ruined the beer in, like a lot of the beer industry because they've geeked it out too much mm-hmm. and this idea that someone has to be a wine pro to take pleasure out of wine is is what deters a lot of people it's yep. the way it's projected like the idea that every time you see someone in a movie drinking a glass of wine or something like that they're in a, like a nice so, mm-hmm. yeah. yep. you're like well I don't dress like that so it's not for me but what do you see in beer commercials you don't see people dress like that no. you know you just don't and, and that's why they win you know in spirits commercials unless it's like a really expensive spirit you don't see people interacting with the beverage like that yeah so you true know, wine is 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 trying to chase a demographic but are the, but like are we really and right. is can wine the answer maybe part of it but I, I would imagine like most people don't want to drink wine out of a can mm-hmm. It's fine. It's very convenient. Yeah. But like at, people were like the, the idea of opening a bottle of wine. Oh, yeah, for sure. But if we can show people doing that more casual, I think that started to change, which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, and be okay championing like the $15 bottle of wine, mm-hmm. you know? Because again, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm guilty of it. It's just the world I live in. I mean, we make luxury wine here. Is I do drink wines like that. Mine, I do at home. I don't necessarily post it. But do we, you know, do I drink a little Cote d'Iron? It's like nineteen ninety nine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we drink them all the time. Chilled, they're fantastic. Yep. But we don't, for some reason, it's like this thing that like we don't really talk about that. Yeah, you know. And I think that for the wine industry to have the impact, and I think that's, I'd say, if if I have a regret about, um, it's a silly thing to say. My grandmother would turn her own grave. It's a regret about ending up in the luxury part of wine is it really has detached me from connecting with my community very well. So I know it's silly, but like I would love to have a wine project that makes like inexpensive wine, because I think just by nature it would connect me with a different mm-hmm. demographic that I would I would, I think I would really take pleasure yeah. interacting with. Like if I could make you know twenty dollar and under wines, yeah, you know, and make them tasty and like connect with that community, because right. no one enters the wine industry through 
you know, the cheapest bottle of wine we at Mega Heights is seventy five dollars. Right. Like, you know, no one starts there. Yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. But I think definitely. you guys but I think you guys are definitely doing like obviously you have Brindo. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which is, you know, still not it's not inexpensive. Under twenty, but no, you know, but but it's it's like, like the cheapest one is like a white one. It's like twenty eight bucks. That's like very. That's so. So being on the side of the industry as well is also I, I'm a, I have a lot of access to data. And when you actually look at it, like a twenty eight dollar bottle of wine is looked at as a luxury bottle because eighty percent of the wine in America is under twenty dollars. It's actually probably like fourteen ninety nine under. So like when you get to like twenty eight dollars for like a bottle of Sauvignon Blanc because it comes from Napa and it's made by. You know, Brittany, who's a really well-known winemaker, and name. we, you know, <coughs> it's made on very expensive ground, and we farm it biodynamically. There's a reason for it to be expensive. It's still expensive. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's difficult in Napa to have entry-level wine. I know the numbers behind it. It's really, really difficult. And yep. it, it, in the next five years, it'll be non-existent. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Before we get out of here, should we switch over to some more rapid-fire music? Like yeah. Yeah. Our guy here. All right. I, I mean, as long as he's okay being in a hot seat, yeah, we're good. Yeah, for okay. sure. Uh, right. First off, was was the were the braids in high school inspired by Alan Ivers- Iverson? You know, Alan Iverson. <laughs> he was, you know, um, he spent a lot of D- a lot of time in DC because you know mm-hmm. he was he was at um, Georgetown. He'd always be out in clubs, and you know, but that was that era. Um, everybody had them. I mean, okay. Right? There was you, know, you had cornrows, but then there was also like the really thin braids that everyone had. Yeah, so I had those for a while. Yeah, I, I wore it all, you know. Yeah, I, I was either going to be him or you, we just saw Jamie Foxx and uh, the Kanye West thing. It was yeah. either those braids. Yeah. I didn't know which who inspired him. <laughs> it was, him, it was yeah. the same era. Okay. It was the same era. I mean, when you look at that, he was, yeah, it was like, um, he did that album, uh, was it 02? He made it and came out in 04. Yep. So, yeah, I graduated from high school in 02. So, okay. I, I grew my hair out in 98. I had long hair for about five years. Um, wow. Yep. And yeah, that was like a thing. You know, yeah, most it was a pain more. in the ass. I enjoy being bald much more. It's so yeah. much easier. Oh yeah. My uh, sister used to braid. Fire. My sister was like, she was like the girl in our hood that would always braid hair. She was really good at it. Her and, and one of my cousins. So that was a luxury. I didn't have to pay. But man, it's such a pain in the ass. Mm-hmm. It really is. Um, but I feel like once you go bald, you, it comes with the package that you're going to grow a beard. Like I, I haven't got that yet. <laughs> it's about so, balance. Yeah. 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 About, I just I just grew this in like a couple years ago mm-hmm. for the first time. Definitely. Yeah. Interesting. Well, let's go. Let's do the music. I'm, I'm, I'm excited. Yeah. So I know I asked you at some point during Harvest, and it was pretty early. I, I just want to see if the answer changed. Is it still CLB over Donda? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I like some of the music. It's just, you know, I, I, uh, I I'm actually, I'm, I'm a huge Kanye fan. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I've, even through all of his ups and downs, and I always tell people, I don't care about that. I don't. I, I, he's not in my house. I don't care if he says something goes off. Right. I, he's a musician. I listen to his music. His music is, there's very few people in the world who have ever made so much more brilliant music as he's made. Mm-hmm. I'm not, I'm, and I'm not even touching the stuff that he released under his own name. I'm talking about just stuff he's produced. Oh, yeah. 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 He's, he's a brilliant guy. He really is. Um, and uh, But yeah, Donna was like not one of my favorite. Okay. Like I, He has better albums than that. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. much yeah. better. Yeah. But I think he also, I, what, I, what I do like about it is that I, I love that he has a freedom to do what he feels is how he wants to express himself yeah. and he you know he's got i think enough he has enough success now he can do that yep um but is it what i want to always listen to driving around like that's always a test like what do you put on when you're in the car right or you're just chilling around the house like i'm not listening to donda you know okay and yeah yeah certified lover boy yeah i like you. drake yeah i like drake yep yeah I have nothing to say. Good question. Yeah. There you go. It's yeah, a I mean, good pick. I understand yeah, yeah. it. Yeah. It, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's a very good album, Donna. Yeah, yeah it it's, it's, you would tell me Donna versus someone else's, it would be Donna. But between those sure. two albums, you know, I just think it's that fair, Drake fair. Drake has um, it's a fair trade. Man. Yep. Fair he's trade. very brilliant at making music that's very melodic, mm-hmm. and you know, it just is like it's just the way he's and he's a great lyricist, actually. Definitely. Yeah. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think I'm wrong. J Cole is your favorite, right? I wouldn't say my favorite, but I really, he's, uh, he's I think he brought a lot to um, the genre that people probably don't give him credit for. Because mm-hmm. he's, I wouldn't say he's like the most exciting rapper. It's not who he's trying to be, but I thought, I think he's, um, he's so thoughtful um, and, and intentional. And he's, he really went like sort of counter to the way I think a lot of rappers like present themselves and the way they talk about things. And um, I, I really like that about him. You know what I mean? I, I like yeah. when you, See him go on stage. He came on stage with like some Crocs and sweatpants because yeah, that was just, just like what he wore. 
Yeah. And he was like, yeah, I'm comfortable with this. Like the fact that he can do that and because he owns it, he's so confident people would just go with it. Yeah. So I really, I, I like that about, about him. Speaking on those rappers, uh, like J. Cole, Kendrick, Drake, what is your, who, who's in your Mount Rushmore? Top yeah, five. top five. I mean, I, I think without, without a doubt, just because he's, um, I think part of it as well, as you have to remember, is like music is, um, it becomes like a, like the soundtrack to your life, you know? Um, and I was listening to a podcast yesterday, and they were talking about the impact of music versus film. And which one is the most impactful? And, and everyone you know, actually said music. One, because the way you digest it, it's easier to, to, to consume the genre or movie you have to be like sitting and watching. Music, you can be running, you know, mm-hmm. in the house, yeah. car, whatever, you can always hear it. And, you know, you can, um, they're also, it's, it's, it's shorter, right? So mm-hmm. you listen to a four minute song versus sitting and to a, a two hour movie. But I'd say Jay Z, because he, um, one, he was, it was the first rap album I really listened to. Okay. DC people didn't listen to rap. It, it, it was it was mainly because DC and in New York um, didn't have a really great relationship because of crack cocaine, and they were competitors. So a lot of people were getting stuff down south by like Richmond and Petersburg in that area, running up through DC, and it was just this whole cultural rivalry. So I didn't know anybody in DC that listened to rap music. Nobody, like even the early stuff, no one did. We listened to go go music. Go is wow. it's a genre of music that's pretty. It's indigenous to the DC area. It's inspired a lot of music. If you hear um, like LL Cool J, "Rock the Bells," mm-hmm, okay. like when Rick Rubin did that song. He Rick Rubin when he was in New York would come to DC all the time to go to Go Go um, concerts, and he legit brought that up to to play for Rock the Bells. Okay. So um, we grew up listening to Go Go music, but it was also a thing you did. We went to like. Um, it's so like go-go concerts all the time. Okay. I was a drummer in a go-go band when I was in high school. Oh, cool. So when I was around 16, 15, my cousin was dating this guy from Richmond. And he um, um, put on Reasonable Doubt. It was like the first rap album I'd ever heard. And I was like, wow, this is sick. Because no one around me listened to rap. We yeah. listened to go-go and R&B. Every, uh, R&B DC is like big into R&B. Okay. Um, and yeah, and he's just, he's made so much music that's, been around my whole like yeah, adult life definitely. that you know you sort of just go along with him and, mm-hmm. and he's in again I, I like lyricists like it's the reason why I can't get down with like the current rappers not I'm not saying anyone else shouldn't enjoy it but like the trap and all this mumbo rap and stuff it, it's just to me um, they they clearly delineate what was hip hop and rap it, it's always been a little gray it's a good one they to say. made it very clear <laughs> yeah. they're they're rap. Um, it's like mumbling sounds. It's like yeah. it's all like uh, they sound like sound effects for a movie, right? Like to me, like I think that line, like there were songs of Jay Z's that were more rap and songs that were more hip hop, but he's always been a great lyricist, he's very thoughtful and intelligent, and his music was very great. He sort of got the complete package. Got it. You know, I love it. I love it. So you're not listening to Gunna on your way to no, no, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> No, Uzi. I listen. I listen to no, none of those no future. guys. Yep. I mean, I listen to them occasionally, yeah, and mm-hmm. I'm just like, what is this? It's just, and again, I, I, I can see why people like yeah. it because it's studio music. It's like engineered, for like a certain sound and a, a certain beat and a rhythm. Like I get it. I can see it being like people driving around listening to it in clubs. Yeah. But I'm. I like lyrics. Mm-hmm. You know, yep. So I like listen to lyrics. That's I'm right. really horrible at memorizing lyrics. It's just not my brain doesn't work. Mm-hmm. I also don't. Think it's a necessity because I can always listen to the song. So it's weird when people yeah. as well lyrics. Yeah, but uh, I like great lyrics. Love it. Yeah, I can appreciate Gun, that. Gun is, sure. Gun is, um, someone sent me Pusha P, and I was like, cool. I listened to the song, and I was like, this is some retarded shit. <laughs> <laughs> the whole song was like a hook. It was like, like I can understand like part of that mm-hmm. is like a hook, and yeah. then you go in. Yep. But it was the whole song. And then yeah. I'm thinking, I'm like, okay, these people sitting in the studio, who's like, this is great. <laughs> like, I got, nailed it. Yeah. We nailed it. You know what I mean? <laughs> and again, they're getting money, they're successful, whatever. Yeah. I'm, I'm fully supportive of that. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't yeah. mean I have to like it. Oh, no. For sure. You know? Yeah. It's foolish music. Yeah. But I if, look, if it makes people happy, so far, yeah. you know, it's fine. You know, if you're pre-gaming and pushing P comes on, or whatever the case may be, Little baby, whoever it is, it's like yeah. okay, yeah, like like, like, like this is like pregame turn up music, and 
and I'm okay with something like that to get me like. But certain songs like the baby has like when he came with the song "Lonely," I thought that song was great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, it was, it's on my running mix. You listen to yeah. it when I was running today. Yeah. I thought it was great. How'd you like his verse on "Pride Is the Devil"? Or is it, if you if you heard it's like hold on, J Cole's Jake, Pride yeah, yeah, that um, song's great. Yeah, I think that the lyrics. I, I would 100 percent agree with what you said. I think what's not looked up looked at is producers now versus sure. producers back then, mm-hmm. and producers are they're. They've mastered that craft now. Mm-hmm. And maybe it does start with a yay. Or somebody that comes out and says, hey, I'm, I'm an amazing producer. Like it, it's, And then kids are like, oh, I can actually just make beats instead of do, you know, I'll have to rap. But Yeah, you can make a lot, they yeah. can make a lot of money. I mean, yeah. I, I, sometimes I'll, yeah, you can go on and you can listen to like um, playlists of like just all like Jay Dilla, mm-hmm. you know, yep. um, who's, yep. he's in Michigan, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Detroit. Genius guy. I mean, he died when he was, what, 27 or something like that? He was so young. Yeah, he was yeah. super young. And he's a brilliant guy. Definitely he's inspired he's everybody. Insane. Mm-hmm. So there's so many of those guys that just have an ear for music. They're not necessarily always lyricists and things like that, but they that's, I mean, that is what the music is. I mean, even if you're a shitty rapper, you got to be like that. It's sort of hard yeah. to screw it up. You, just, you can just keep repeating push a P over it. And apparently it's like a huge hit. <laughs> <laughs> because Metro produced it. Yeah. yeah. Or yeah. some some. I don't know. It's famous. just on my, my back. But again, I, yeah. I, you know, it's again the risk of sounding like an old guy, but I just, no. it's like there's certain things I look for out of music in that it, yeah. that doesn't provide it for me. And I'm also not at a point in my, my life where I, I need that kind of music. Like I don't, I'm not in a space where I need that. You know what I mean? Like, right. I just, That's fair. I like, you know, I mean, I, my music isn't as loud as it used to be in the car. You know yeah, what I mean? it's, just, it's just not, yeah, yep. you know, I literally, yep. was, so I, I, um, I partnered with Lexus very early on. I was, um, and the first one I got, I was like, this is sick. I blew the speakers out in the second week. <laughs> I was driving through Aspen all the way up, bass all the way up. And it would, for the next year and a half, just rattling. <laughs> you know, it was a long time ago. That yeah. didn't happen anymore. Yeah. yeah. You know, you grow up and then you, you grow up start up. turning the music down a little bit. You know, yeah, I mean, you want lyrics, man. Start going to bed a little early. You know? But you, know, you go on vibe. It's like, you know, you look to me, I, I like listening to things like WizKid, um, oh, yeah, like yeah. Afrobeats. I That's love the music. Fun. Love it. Yeah. Yeah, I could appreciate that. Who else is on that rap Mount Rushmore? There, have Hove, of course, and Kanye for sure. I think he's brilliant. Uh, Common, mm, nice sleeper. Never got the credit he deserves. Mm-hmm. Still doesn't. Yep. He's a brilliant, yep. brilliant rapper. I know you, people always hate on this, but Lauren Hill. Ooh. People actually listen to like her rapping. She's fent- She's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. She's a Super great, dope. great lyricist. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can go. I mean, there's so yeah. many. I like I like real rappers. I tell you someone that I and, and not to go negative here that I just never understood, and I know that he's gotten. I mean, he's one of the gods of the genre, but I never understood Nas. He never did it for me. I never. I didn't like his voice. Mm. Like part of rapping is like your voice, right? Like yeah. you can talk about like yeah. like Biggie is like mm. Biggie Biggie literally on songs used to like rap the alphabet. Yeah, <laughs> and it was just like you just wanted to like vibe. I think that his lyrics were great. Obviously, his production was great. I don't think his voice delivered always for me. And again, obviously, he just need my approval for yeah. his success. <laughs> you know, that obviously, is, uh, that's Daryl's favorite guy. Oh, no, yeah? I would say you, yeah, no. Yeah. There is Nazomatic. Yeah. And my pops would kill me for yeah. this. Everything in between, and then you have like this new resurgence of King's Disease after yeah, actually yeah. that album. King's Disease is an amazing album, and King's Disease too. Yeah. Not Zomatic, the first album. Um, I think a lot of folks could resonate why, like, why, not, why that's on my, like one of the best albums out. But I think there is after the beef, like, mm-hmm. you had to choose a side. You had to choose yeah. Biggie Tupac. You had to choose like a KRS One. Yeah. I mean, I like I like Bert. some Tupac, yeah. and then I like the early on stuff when he was like a little mm-hmm. bit more thoughtful and that. Yeah. Like Death Row Records, you know, because yeah. uh, it really wasn't he, who he was. I mean, the guy went to like. He's like an, uh, a backup dancer and an actor. He mm-hmm. was like faking that, yeah. which, is, which is how he ended up dying, which is so stupid. Yeah. Um, but, you know, perpetrating a fraud, we call it. It's like, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, he was in like, I went through this phase and I was listening to like only Tribe Called Quest for a long time because I just think their music is absolutely brilliant. It's, yeah. it's so layered. It's so complex. It's like all the different voices. Mm-hmm. Everyone has these unique voices all the way through. It's so cool. Yeah. It's like, but that's great music. And then it, you start, again, it's like, how do you go from Tribe Called Quest to Gunna? Like, I'm just sorry. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, yeah. it's just like, 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 okay. So <laughs> they made the clear design. That's rap. Yeah. Like, so I'll stick to, I'll stick to yeah. hip hop. Definitely. Yeah. Oh, give me. What is your favorite uh, Tribe Called Quest song? Out of curiosity. I'll tell you more like albums. The whole album. Yeah, yeah. 
I'm a visual person. So I was super weird. And like 2000, as I went to high school from 2006 to 2010, and that was like on my MP3. I had this yellow MP3 player, like, bro, yeah. kind of afford the iPod at the time. $39.99, dude. And I used to uh, rip off a LimeWire, like a Trackball Quest music, like crazy. So my pops, like, he was definitely a music head, but not as much as me. I got super weird, like, yeah. with, I mean, not super weird, but it was just like four, 15 years later, you know what I mean? But like, a lot of people jump to Benito Applebaum or Check the Rhyme or something like that. But What's yeah. the Scenario is probably one of the best, the remix. Oh, that's great. One of the best, like, group songs there. Have, I, there's so many lyricists in that song. Like, and then they had a whole click, so it was like, um, from my understanding, yeah, De La Soul, who, was, who yeah. Uber slept on as one of the best yeah. groups out there. But also, I mean, Buster Rhymes, a lot of people don't even know that Buster Rhymes was a part of a group before he started, yeah. rap, before he mm-hmm. went solo. So, yeah, yeah. Um, Lords of the Underground was another one. Like, I had this for some, I don't know, man. It was but like, I was playing catch up here. Like, I told you, we didn't yeah. really listen to rap. So, this is all like new. Yeah. Um, so, Low End Theory, I probably listen to the most. Okay. I could always look when I see the cover. I can remember. Yeah. Um, so, I didn't, I didn't start listening to, to them until later. Yeah. We I, again, it was all playing catch up at that point because yeah. I didn't, mm-hmm. we didn't really listen to rap. But I, um, I just always loved the integration of jazz into their music, yeah. uh, into their beats, which I thought that was just really. Um, like really incredible, um, super smooth. And video, super videos smooth. as well. They had like mm-hmm. different videos, like um, what you would see on like your know, MTV raps, or when you go back to like YouTube, like you see their videos and whatnot. It was it was a little bit different. They also had the intro to William Bros too. So shout out to them. Yeah, yeah. you yeah. know, I, I I someone who I, I used to not get in like maybe about two years ago. I started to like ah, oh, it was Rick Ross. Mm. He was in that same realm of just like yeah. I just didn't understand. And then he put out this album, and I was like, "Wow, it was it was really incredible because it wasn't just like like you know bullshit rap talk. It was like yeah. mastermind. Yeah. yeah, it was it was um it was so well produced, and the in the music was what well, came out right after mastermind because the mastermind was the intro. Oh, of the ra- rather you than me. In yes. seventeen. That album mm-hmm. was so great, yep. and it was like the first time you could see like the music become like mature mm-hmm. and his lyrics are better. I was like, "Wow, this guy's good." He, and again, yep. same thing in delivery. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. the guy can say anything, and it's just, like, he crushes it. Yeah, he has a voice for it. Yeah. He, I, lyrics, I mean, he is, uh, he does say some things, though. Like, Rick Ross will throw a few a few lines out there that, Correct, he will. that might get you, yeah. but. But a lot of it's, like, grandiose. Yeah. Check out my Lamborghini, how much money I have, yeah. sort of thing. I Go. hate that kind of stuff. <laughs> it's, like, another, <laughs> yeah. that's true. That's it's true. just not my kind of thing, but I think. It's luxury rap, right? For the most yeah. part. Quote, unquote. Know, yeah. It's, like, motivational, and, like, when you hear him speak, it's, like, oh. Really out yeah. Like, okay. Yeah, he is. He's like take over the world now. Yeah. Well, he's like trying to like teach people how to be entrepreneurs yep. and things like that mm-hmm. and get their own stuff. Definitely. Like that. I think that's, uh, and I think that that's a beautiful thing that's happened to to, to rap culture is like, um, you know, a lot of them sort of becoming smarter business people. Mm-hmm. Same thing in, in, in athletics is um, they're not really allowing themselves to be taken advantage of anymore. Yeah. And they're owning things and the amount of wealth now is is beautiful. Great, yes. these guys. I mean, you look at LeBron. LeBron was a billionaire by the age of like what, thirty six, thirty seven, and he's still playing basketball he's at a high 50, level. Scored fifty six last high level. And yeah, at, yeah. Level. And you're nineteen. That's, that's yeah, nuts. Jamal. But these guys are, you know, they're they're smart business people. They're making more money off the court now yeah. on the court. Oh, yeah, mm-hmm. sure. You know, and a lot of the rappers they're making more money outside of the genre than the music they're making. Yeah, Definitely. they're just smart. I mean, you look at again, Kanye is a perfect example. Yeah. He made his wealth, you know, outside of music. Oh, yep. A lot of those guys do. Jay Z too. Yeah. Yeah, and mm-hmm. it's it's uh, I, I think it's a really beautiful thing of just because it, you know before obviously there was there was this correlation between black community, especially athletes and, and musicians, just being like these idiots who just got taken advantage of like a bunch of flash. They don't have any assets and things like that. And these guys are smart enough, and like now they're they're like growing actual wealth. Yeah. They are. Yeah. All right, man. I love it, man. We appreciate yes. you, man. Seriously. Uh, yeah. Thank you. You got places to be. We got places to be. You guys do too. Be. Yeah. <laughs> you got a reservation. Yeah, we, yeah. Oh, yeah, I gotta get there. <laughs> yeah, so we got to get there. Uh, again, just thank you for taking the time. Um, thanks for everything that you've obviously done with the Roots Fund, uh, with Heights. Um, again, just making it easier for people like myself to come in here, work production, get something out of it, bring it back to a whole different region and start to do my own thing like yeah. back in Michigan. So kudos to you. That's the goal, man. You Definitely. on the run today. Um, it's a great run. Yeah. We'll be in touch for sure. Yeah, coffee.
Thank you again. Thank you, man. And the domino, effect, the, the domino effect, the domino effect, sorry, not to yeah. off at all, but the domino effect I had on Jamal, Jamal's bringing it back. Like he's, he's doing, I mean, doing things for real. And, and he's putting us on, uh, not only from the podcast perspective, but just everybody around him, man. Yeah. Like, so awesome. I much appreciate it, man. Much appreciate it. That's what it's about. Yes, sir. Take a little bit and grow it. it is. Music in a Bottle, episode 92. Yeah.